Well, good morning. This is Senate Judiciary, a little bit late this morning due to floor action. Um, and we are taking up, it's Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021. We're taking up H18 and actually to, relating to sexual exploitation of children. But it's a fairly um, specific area of law that we will get into. It has to do with um, <clears throat> proposals to include simulated conduct with, within the definition of sexual conduct for the purposes of crimes involving sexual exploitation of children. <clears throat> and this is an issue that we took up last year, and we're continuing our work on that, uh, on this issue. We passed legislation last year, but this is to um, regarding a specific portion of that. So, Michelle, go ahead. If you could remind us a little bit of last year's bill as well as what's changed in this year's. Sure. And is it okay if I share my screen to put the language? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Um, so, uh, Senator Sears is correct. So, last year you uh, passed legislation um, updating uh, Chapter 64, which is the title. Uh, which is the chapter on sexual exploitation of children, and that's in Title 13, and that focuses mostly on um, the on production and possession of child sexual exploitation materials. And so there were a number of little tweaks that you did that were upon the recommendation of the <coughs> and you passed that, but there was one issue that there wasn't consensus on, and that was the issue of um, including simulated sexual conduct involving a child? And, and where does that, how could that fit in with this? And, um, and I believe Mr. Raymond had talked about to you about some certain scenarios that fell outside of the law that they couldn't prosecute and why they the additional language uh, for simulated. Um, but it just, um, folks were in disagreement about what that language should look like. And so what you have now is a proposal um, that does incorporate simulated uh, conduct into the definition. Um, and they, there was quite a few hearings on it in the House. And so we had the, both the Attorney General's Office, Defender General's Office and the state's attorneys as well in there discussing the language. I will cautiously say, uh, you know, they <coughs> uh, an, an agreement with regard to the generally, with regard to the language, but I'll um, I'll let them speak for for themselves. I think it's I'm not saying any necessarily supports it, but I think there was um, people got to a point of being comfortable with the language, and so let me put that up on the screen for you. Um, can everybody see that? Yep. Okay. So, um, so you're looking at section one in the definition section that would apply to the entire title. I remember just a little refresher when we're talking about a child, we're talking so about someone who is under 16 years of age. And so you see subdivision two is the definition of sexual conduct. And then all the different things that constitute sexual conduct purposes of the chapter. And you'll see the addition on the top of page two of the new subdivision G. So any simulation of the conduct that's described above. So it may not actually be occurring the simulation of that particular conduct of A through F. So there's a new subdivision seven that's added here to further define simulation. So it means the explicit depiction of any conduct that's up above that we just took a look at that one, it must involve a child as defined in current law. So we're talking about a, a, a full child, a live child. So we're not talking about that the, that the conduct is what's simulated, not the child. And then subdivision seven. So, uh, a child, it has to be a child, not a um, cartoon of a child. Correct. Correct. Yep. So the second is under subdivision seven A. It, it has to create the appearance of such conduct that's listed up above, and it has to on on the third. It has to exhibit the naked genitals, buttocks, or breasts below the top of the areola. 
So you have to have an actual child. It has to create the appearance of the prohibited conduct, and it has to exhibit um, nudity as, as provided there. So you have to have all three things for it to fall under the definition of simulation for purposes of this chapter. Um, you'll see in subdivision 7B, simulation does not include- well, Wait a minute. Okay. It has to be both naked genitals, buttocks, or breasts, or is it any of the yes. three? Yes. It could it has, be any it of has them. To be, okay. Because you just said something to the effect that it had to be all three. It could oh, be the, any uh, one of the three or all. She, Michelle meant the first three. Um, oh. Oh, okay. One, two, and three. Right. Oh, okay. I meant the right. I meant that it has oh, okay. to be an actual child create the parents' conduct, and there has to be nudity involved. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so you'll see in subdivision seven B, simulation doesn't include paintings, drawings, or non-visual or written descriptions of sexual conduct. And subdivision seven C, as I mentioned earlier, simulation applies to the conduct, not to a simulated child. And then the then it takes effect on July 1st. So um, I think probably what's, if it works for you, is that rather than going into all the details about how this came about, is maybe if you hear from the witnesses and they can talk to you a little bit about their process and why they've gotten to this point here. And then I'll be here to answer any questions. Yeah, I think, actually, I'm going to jump right to Matthew Raymond. I think that's what I would prefer to do, <clears throat> who could talk about um, as the uh, director of the Internet Crimes Against Children's Task Force, um, so just to make sure we have time to hear from him uh, on, on the bill. And I might add that, that the same bill as introduced by the um, is S8 introduced by Senators Ruth, Sears, and Hooker um, is the same as H18. As introduced. So, um, Mr. Raymond, thank you for being with us again. Thank you for having me. And thank you and the committee for its work in passing the laws um, last year around this. Um, and it's uh, really been beneficial. Um, just to remind everybody, um, we're uh, the Vermont Internet, I'm the commander of the Vermont Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. And um, we, our primary purpose is to prevent the victimization or exploitation of children through um, the computers, technology, or the internet. Um, we receive um, just in cyber tips alone, which come from um, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children from electronic service providers um, that find child exploitation on their sites. We get between uh, three and 400 complaints a year at this point. Um, and the changes that were made last year really address uh, helping to uh, work through those cases more effectively and protect children in Vermont better. Um, How many the cases did you just say? I missed that. Between three and 400, that's just from electronic service providers. That's not counting, uh, you know, referrals we get from DCF, parents, schools, other police agencies. Uh, but that's just, that's just the cyber tips alone. And uh, on top of doing the investigations, of course, we also do uh, examinations uh, of devices. And um, kind of the third leg of our stool is um, education, because uh, obviously that's of uh, most importance to us is to educate um, children, parents, uh, teachers, the general public um, about online safety uh, to protect our children. Um, so uh, as far as the law changes, the last uh, one that we'd asked for was to incorporate simulated. Um, unfortunately, there's many um, images out there that get uh, circulated that don't, that I think everybody when they looked at it would consider um, child sexual abuse material but just don't fit under the current uh, uh, statutory language. Um, and uh, I apologize in advance uh, to be graphic, but one such uh, image, or we have many such of these images, but um, there's like three or four year old clothed girls standing right in front of an adult male with an exposed erect penis. 
but the problem is from the camera angle, you can't tell if there's actually contact between the penis and the mouth. There could be, but there could not be. And then that currently doesn't fit the definition, but the simulated uh, language would draw that in um, as child sexual abuse material. And I would uh, believe that everybody would uh, agree that that is a, you know, an atrocious image and should be currently uh, fit the definitions. So that that's just one example. Um, I th um, but why um, that I would ask that this get passed the I think the language um, that has been proposed this year is uh, better and does uh, uh, take care of all the uh, issues that were brought up last year about the concerns. Um, you know, I've uh, seen the movie taxi I've seen cuties and all the other ones and not, this language would not apply to those movies that wouldn't meet the statutory requirements that as laid out here. And I can answer any questions anybody has. Yeah, I, um, unfortunately I just lost my video. Try to bring it back. <clears throat> um, talk about unstable broadband today. Uh, <laughs> Can you, um, has the pandemic resulted in an increase in the behavior or uh, no, in terms of the, the cases that you're seeing? Yeah, so the first few months um, of the stay home, stay safe uh, procedures, um, way back in like March or April of last year uh, into May, we were seeing at first like a one and a half and then a two and a half um, times increase in the number of cyber tips we were getting those months. Um, and usually, usually those months are actually, um, there's kind of an ebb and flow to cyber tips. Usually those are down a little bit. Um, I think it's because people are starting to get outside and maybe with computers some more. But um, <clears throat> with everybody in, we did see a, a sharp rise. And then, um, and then how much was attributed after that? It's hard to say because each year we're seeing um, just market increases each year in the cyber tips. Uh, when we first started doing cyber tips, um, I think it has increased like 219% the amount of cyber tips we get currently versus in 2015 when the agent office took over um, stewardship of the ICAG. Um, it just keeps going up each year. So it's hard, to, it's hard to take off how much of that is pandemic related now and how much of that is just the natural you know, occurrence of things that, that has been going on. And I apologize, anybody can hear that. That's my dog is snoring. In oh, practice. that's fine. <laughs> We're used to my dog taking over committee meetings when somebody's outside or he wants to go out or come back in. We don't mind. And pets are important to have around us, but sometimes they don't understand Zoom meetings. <laughs> um. I don't have any other questions for uh, Thank Director you. Raymond, but I appreciate your joining us. Senator Nick. I was just wondering, um, where were we hung up last year? Why didn't it pass? Why didn't we include it? Well, we passed a lot of the bill, but we didn't include this because of a concern that was particularly speaking to dogs. <laughs> oh. That was particularly expressed by um, Marshall Paul regarding movies like Taxi and when those issues might have been simulated um, acts and would they be uh, criminal or not. So we decided to wait until we looked at this issue again. I'm going to go take care of the dog, but maybe um, Detective Raymond can ask, answer the question or Perhaps um, Marshall Paul would like to jump in. Okay. Yeah, the, the lang there was language um, included that wasn't included last year, um, which includes uh, exhibiting the, the, the nudity requirement um, that wasn't in the bill last year. Um, and that, uh, I believe that language mirrors the New York language, which actually was where Taxi was filmed. Um, so, and is predominant in um, actually a majority of states, I believe. 
So, but um, the attorneys can speak better about that aspect to it rather than I can. But I think that's where it was hung up last year was not including that type of language. I see. Marshall. Sure, thank you. Um, and good morning to the committee. Um, that is where we were hung up last year. And I agree uh, with Detective Raymond that at this point, the bill is not, it, it, you know, we've addressed the two primary concerns that I had last year, which were the over-inclusiveness of the language, um, which, you know, closely related was the potential unconstitutionality of that language. Um, I still have concerns about the language in this bill, but they are not concerns with over-inclusiveness or constitutionality. Um, they, it's simply that this definition of simulation is not consistent with what's done with what is, it doesn't reflect the language that's used in the case law. Um, it's not clear and it's just sort of a, you know, it's an ugly way to, to write a definition is to include the word that you're defining in the definition, which this one does. And my primary concern is with this, um, you know, subsection 7C, which says simulation applies to conduct, not to a simulated child. Um, because that's where we get into that territory of using the word simulation in our definition or scope of the word simulation. We had in the House proposed some language that would have used the, the words that are used by the US Supreme Court and by other federal and state courts when they're considering this issue. They use the language actual child or real child. So they simply say that in order for a simulation to be um, prohibitable, it must essentially be the product of sexual exploitation of an actual or real child. That's the language that I proposed in the House. That language was consistent with, uh, there had been testimony in the House from uh, Professor uh, Peter Teachout from Vermont Law School. Um, he had proposed similar language or identified a similar concern. Um, and that's also, you know, that's, like I said, that's consistent with what's used in the case law. The Attorney General's office had an opposition to that language. I'll let them explain their opposition to that language um, in part because uh, you know, I think they are gonna explain it, their opposition better than I am. And frankly, I don't quite understand their opposition, um, but that's why we wound up with the language we wound up with. Like I said, we do feel that this language is probably constitutional and not over-inclusive. We still don't support the language because it's our opinion that when you are, you know, messing around with laws that are, and really not just messing around with, but really that, you know, greatly expanding the scope of laws that are, um, you know, carry very significant sentences. These are five-year felonies, 10-year felonies, 15-year felonies, um, that it's really important to do the absolute best you can to keep the law tightly reflective of the boundaries that have been set by the US Supreme Court and uh, you know, federal courts in our jurisdiction. Um, and to me, that means using the language that they use, which is actual or real child, which in addition to being reflective of the actual case law, um, we feel is, is just simply clearer because that avoids this problem of using the word simulation to define the scope of the word simulation. Um, so that's our answer. It, you know, we're happy to provide the same language that we had provided in the past, though. Um, you know, just one other thing I'd like to add is that we've been in communication with a uh, law professor, um, uh, Professor Christina Hessek, who's really, you know, among people who have written about the scope of the First Amendment with regard to child pornography and actually about how to draft a child pornography law. She is sort of the preeminent scholar there. She's written the only articles um, that are really specifically about not just child pornography in the First Amendment, but about statutory drafting and how to draft the best 
child pornography law that incorporate that you know covers everything that is covered by First Amendment case law, but does not cover the things that are not covered by First Amendment case law. She and I have been exchanging emails and she has not yet given me um, her opinion of this language. Uh, we just most recently emailed back and forth last night um, and she wanted to see more of the language from the chapter. So I sent her the whole chapter and I haven't heard back yet. Um, I assume that this is not going to be, assuming this won't be voted on today and that there will be an opportunity for further testimony, I'd like the opportunity to come back um, and perhaps even uh, if Professor Hesek has anything particularly, you know, if she looks at this and says, I think this is fine, I think this reflects actually some case law that's out there that, you know, perhaps I didn't know about and that, uh, you know, this is consistent with what's done in other states, then we would probably withdraw every objection that we have to this because my objection to this is the fact that it doesn't reflect the case law and that it is inconsistent with what's done in other places around the country. And so, but if she tells me that I'm wrong about that, I'm happy to withdraw that objection. Uh, but if she tells us that there's problems in this that we hadn't identified, um, I'd like the opportunity for us to bring that information back to the committee or perhaps even to bring Professor Hessek uh, to testify. Um, so that's what I would leave this as is, you know, for now, we certainly think that this is constitutional, and not over-inclusive. We just think that there's a better way to do this that's more accurate, um, more carefully ties to the case law that's out there. And um, to the extent that, uh, you know, our reaching out to experts in the field leads us to a different conclusion over the next few days, we'd certainly like the opportunity to either withdraw our objections or uh, bring the committee some more specific information about those objections. A muted dog patrol. Um, the good news for you is that we will not vote on the bill today. Um, won't even vote on the bill this week. So I suspect we'll come back to it uh, early next week. And uh, so we Yes, we would love to hear from, uh, what's her name again, Hester? Uh, Professor Carissa Hessick at, um, Hessick. Professor I'm trying to remember Hessick. the law school she's at. It's That's all right, if, if, if she's willing to testify, um, you just let Peggy know and-, and Absolutely. So just let us know maybe by the end of the week when we put together our agenda for next week. Um, 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 so I'm happy to hear from her, from you and uh, whatever. Take it up again next week sometime. Certainly, Senator. Okay. Uh, that's the good news. Um, anything else for Marsh? Any questions for Marshall? I'm sorry I missed part of your testimony. I was taking care of the dog. Okay. Um, next up uh, is um, James Pepper from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Uh, good afternoon, uh, or good morning. Uh, James Pepper, morning. Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. So, um, you know, this, the state's attorneys are, are very supportive of this bill. Certainly there's a compelling interest in uh, preventing children from uh, being participating in the production of sexual abuse material. Um, we think that the addition of requiring nudity, actual nudity, uh, you know, takes this squarely into the realm of uh, a crime and not in protected speech. Um, and, uh, you know, just the state's attorneys, just for the record, don't really um, prosecute these crimes. These are generally handled by Matt Raymond um, in the Attorney General's office, the Internet Crimes Against Children um, Task Force. So, uh, but, you know, the, the mere fact, so they ask for this bill and, and, you know, if they're asking for it, I think it really indicates that, you know, they've had to decline prosecutions because of this simulation. Um, I don't want to call it a loophole, but this gap in the law. And so the state's attorneys are, are very supportive of this language. Um, you know, they were supportive. They believe that the addition of nudity um, is what, it was an improvement over last year's bill. So they believe this, the 
as introduced bill is constitutional but certainly support this this version that as passed by the house version as well i don't have uh, much more to add um but uh, i think a lot of the kind of substance of the debate in the house was between the attorney general's office and the defender general all right well thank you very much and uh, have a great day Thank you. So we'll turn right to David Scheer, and if we don't finish his testimony this morning, we will pick up with him on next week. And we'll probably hear from you next week, uh, if, depending upon how you and Marshall and uh, the professor. Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> For the record, David Scheer with the Attorney General's Office. And, you know, I think a lot of the important substance has already been spoken about this morning on this bill. Uh, Commander Raymond, as he always does, did a good job of explaining the necessity for the bill and why we're asking for it. There has This bill has been the subject of a lot of discussion already. Um, and as Marshall Paul pointed out, you know, we, we, there is agreement on the constitutionality of this, but I, I think there, um, you know, there remains a disagreement on precisely the right way to draft it. We support this language. Uh, we think that this is a good way to move forward that both addresses the issues of constitutionality while also addressing some of the concerns of our criminal division with respect to um, how exactly we create a definition that doesn't uh, unintentionally make a higher barrier to prosecution than is constitutionally necessary or uh, than we really intend to create. Um, I think that, you know, one of the key points of disagreement is that, uh, uh, you know, there's a preference on one side to precisely imitate some of the language in the federal constitutional case law, the US Supreme Court case law in particular, um, by defining child for the purposes of a simulation as being an actual child uh, and using that terminology. It's a position of our office that having that modifier to the term child could be interpreted by a Vermont court to uh, mean something in addition to uh, what the current definition of child is, which, and, you know, it's our, our reading of the statute that um, the current definition of a child already means uh, a real human being who is under 16 years old. Um, and so adding that additional term could potentially lead a Vermont court to say, well, you know, it already meant a real human being under 16. What does this actual mean on top of that? You've got to bring more facts to prove that. And, you know, that's an area of disagreement uh, in terms of statutory interpretation. Um, but it's our, we, you know, we support this language. It's our belief that this language is constitutional and it doesn't add that sort of wrinkle that we are worried about how a Vermont court might interpret, uh, interpret that wrinkle. Um, and, you know, it's our read that a Vermont court may not necessarily feel, uh, you know, look to the federal case law to say that that's what that must mean. Uh, they could do that. Uh, but they may just say, look, it's another word. Um, we need to give that word meaning as we do in the course of statutory interpretation um, because we read words not to be um, superfluous as a matter of uh, statu standard statutory interpretation. And so we're going to require the state to bring forward another element of proof. So that's our, that was our concern with adding that. Obviously, again, you know, that, that is an area of statutory interpretation. Um, where we weren't in 100% agreement, but we do support this language. We do believe it uh, addresses the constitutional issues. Um, and, you know, we're happy to continue the discussion uh, if we hear more from experts on the issue and, and see, see where that might take us. But uh, that's where we are on it and don't want to rehash the entirety of our prior discussions, but I hope that gives the committee uh, a brief overview of, of where we've been and where we are. And, and again, happy to continue that discussion as needed. How many prosecutions are there in Vermont? Under this, no, under these yeah, statutes? Yearly under these statutes. I'd actually ask Commander Raymond if he is still on the line. I don't have that number off the top of my head. He is more likely to. Yeah, each year there's, uh, our arrests are between 40 and 50 persons. Thank you. That's helpful. I, understand the scale.
I mean, uh, are any of those what we might term as sexting? Well, uh, it, no, not under what you're th what the com what's commonly referred to as sexting. So when we have underage uh, uh, children sexting their age counterparts, um, we don't accept those cases for investigation at the ICAC because we have such a backlog of cases that involve, uh, you know, like 40 year old men um, with under eight year old girls. Um, so during we, the, we uh, the reason I asked is during our conversation last week about current Hatton, we heard of cases where um, 15 year old asking um, uh, 10 year old or whatever to send pictures. Yeah, well, yeah uh, we have not had um, cases that involve juvenile on juvenile. Um, we've assisted local jurisdictions with handling them when they couldn't figure some stuff out. But um, our, our priorities on adults that are abusing yeah, young children. They're abusing. And, and generally, the children are under 10. Yeah, many times under eight. In fact, uh, the two real disturbing trends that came out this year that, that uh, I, I noticed I review all the cases and assign them um, are uh, 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 just a marked increase in toddler and infant uh, abuse in Vermont, um, where there's uh, sexually assaulting infants and toddlers and sharing the videos um, and um, sextortion, um, which is when um, somebody convinces, uh, you know, it's usually an adult male convincing a young um, child to send sexually explicit images and then uses those that, you know, first of all, they pretend to be their friend or offer them something. And then uh, as soon as they get the first image, it, it changes, uh, you know, 180 degrees and they start threatening them to do worse and worse <laughs> things on videos um, to, uh, to get more uh, child sexual abuse material from these children. And <clears throat> um, many times when we have the victims in Vermont, the offenders are actually in another state and then it works uh, vice versa when there's victims in another state uh, the, and the offenders are here, they transfer those cases to us. We work with, there's 61 ICACs across the country and we work in concert on those type of cases and then typically prosecute those where the offender resides. Senator White. So I have to admit that um, this whole conversation is making me feel queasy. But, um, <clears throat> and I hope that you throw the book at the offenders here. But my question is, what happens to the children? How, how do we address their, the children? Right. So the sooner the children are identified and the faster they receive services, um, the better the rest of their life will be. Um, and that's pretty universally known. Um, so we work actively to identify uh, the children. When we identify the children that are here in Vermont, obviously um, we make a report to DCF. Uh, we get services involved right away. Um, and, and, you know, whether that child needs to be removed from their surroundings or not, whether it was a, you know, family member or a familial like um, offender, um, you know, make, obviously goes into all those decision-making points in those cases. Um, and then nationally, uh, you know, when we have an uh, uh, offender here that has victimized somebody from afar, um, we rely on those states to get those services to those children. And then, then there's always those children we weren't able to identify, right, that we see in abuse in images. Because currently, um, what used to be thought that there was a, you know, a small amount of um, child pornography circulated among, um, you know, a small amount of offenders is, is this not true? Um, we've done a better tracking and we're up to like 4.5 million hash and it might even be more than that now. Um, hash value and a hash value is a, a digital signature of an of a, of a image or video that's unique to that image or video. So we know of at least, you know, four and a half million um, uh, images and videos. Now that doesn't mean four and a half victims because, you know, it can be multiple unfortunately, multiple incidents for per child. So then we worked all together um, and, and with NECMEX CVIP, the Child Victim Identification Program, um, so that 
we pull information about all of our uh, series. Like if this child's been seen before, um, then they're a recognized child. If they've been identified, they're an identified child. And if we don't, we've never seen this child before. It's a, it's a new unknown child. And then we work uh, together because if someone took 10 pictures of a, of a child and you put all the background pieces together, we might be able to identify that child. But if I only have one of them, Georgia ICAC has one, Florida ICAC has one, um, so that's why we work with CVIP to pool all that stuff and then we'll go through the uh, images or videos and try to identify something uh, in there to identify the children and then uh, have the appropriate ICAC go make the rescue of that child. Well, <clears throat> I really appreciate everybody's testimony this morning and, and we'll pick up again.